Let's turn to uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, and this uh, morning we're going to continue in this series, and specifically going to look at the passage that deals with Mary and how the angel came to her and told her uh, not to be afraid, to uh, fear not. Friday, uh, Angie and I made our way to Bisco, where I grew up, uh, see my mom and dad, and so we were in the backyard. My mom was raking leaves. I think as many were blowing out of the trees as what she was uh, raking up. She had a couple burn piles going. My daddy had a chair. He was watching my mama uh, out there rake the leaves. Anyway, we sat down. We uh, were able to visit, and the same question that she has asked me before came up. She said, what are we going to do this Christmas? And she asked me that question a couple of weeks ago, and I said, well, let me talk with my sister Tammy, and we'll kind of figure this thing out. And uh, uh, so we kind of walked through the scenario, talked about it. Now, whether or not, I don't know what your family's going to do, but we've made a choice as our family. The Bisco Masons are going to stay in Bisco this Christmas, and the Jonesboro Masons are going to stay in Jonesboro. We normally come together at my mama's house, and there's a large group of us, and uh, my mom and dad are up in age. And so, you know, each family has to make that decision. So it was pretty hard. I was talking to my mama, and I could tell by the look on her face. Uh, I said, I know you're, you know, you're not going to get to see your great-grandkids, and I hate that, and it hurts me. You know, and as Angie and I were uh, driving uh, back home, I really thought about this. I thought, you know, I, I cannot even imagine me because I'm around uh, my grandsons here all the time and my sons. And I thought, you know, my mom's really hurting uh, not being able to be with Angie and I or her grandsons or uh, to see her great grand- grandkids. And that may be where some of you are today. Maybe where a lot of you are trying to make decisions uh, of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and, and how uh, you're going to uh, be safe uh, in regard to that. That's why I believe that this message today uh, is so very important. Um, you know, the Colorado governor came out, you, I read an article about this, and he reversed his decision about churches because a Gallup poll that was done in November showed that churches were uh, essential. Amen. And, uh, you know, if they'd have called me, I could have saved them a whole lot of time and money. If they just asked me, I could have told them that churches uh, were uh, essential. And, you know, as I even began to research some more stuff, and as I was thinking about my mom and I was thinking about churches and uh, began to look to see, you know, what's taking place among children, among teenagers, and how to really spot uh, the anxiety and discouragement that a lot of people are facing uh, today, it really just made me realize even more, in fact, I already knew that it's important, whether we're gathering online, whether in in person, for the church to come together and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and exalt Him. Amen? I mean, really, more than ever before, I hope that we see that uh, as a, uh, as a, a church family uh, in doing that. So, man, I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to, uh, as we study uh, through this passage of Scripture, to really pay attention uh, and to realize what the Lord is saying about, do not be afraid. And, too, I want to encourage you with this. Now, we've also made a decision as a church um, that we're not going to have our live Christmas Eve services. And it was a hard decision for all of us. I love that. We've been doing that uh, for a long time. We have multiple services uh, on the Christmas Eve. We have thousands of people who gather, and and we just believe that we probably couldn't do that as safe as we needed to uh, on Christmas Eve. So, uh, Pastor Jeff uh, and the worship team from here and from Perigo have put together a Christmas Eve service that's going to show uh, online uh, at 11, at 1, at 3, at 5, and at 7 on Christmas Eve. Now, I'm telling you that because here's what you're going to need to do. If you want to be encouraged, you're going to have to figure out what time that you're going to participate in that and be a part, and you're going to have to make yourself be a part of it. You hear me? It's just like getting up on Christmas Eve and figuring out which service you're going to come to in live or getting up on Sunday morning being here or engaging online. You need to decide with your family and you need to put your phones down. You need to engage. You need to stand up and worship the Lord. Uh, Hey, it's okay if you have a cup of coffee in your hand, you're worshiping the Lord or apple cider or whatever it is on Christmas Eve, but figure out a time, get your family, however that's going to be. If it's you or you got a whole bunch of you, you know, together, your family, hey, and worship the Lord on Christmas Eve. You need that. It is essential. It is important. It will encourage you uh, in doing that. And then also, too, I want to challenge you with this. Whether, however you're going to do it, I know yesterday or Friday, uh, Angie said, uh, well, really, our daughter-in-law, Kelsey, told Angie, said, you know what we can do with your mom and dad? We can FaceTime them. Like when we're together and the grandkids are opening gifts. So Angie told my mama, said, hey, we can FaceTime. My mama looked at us. She said, we don't do FaceTime very well whatsoever. And so anyway, I said, we'll get my sister there. So however you're going to do that, 
with your family. I would challenge you, okay, be a part of a Christmas Eve service, but also read the Christmas story. Figure out which one of you are gonna do that, okay? Mom, dad, cousin, Bobby, Jane, Joe, whoever, okay? Uh, you know, if you got the theatrical voice, you can read it, whatever, but read the Christmas story because in all aspects of the Christmas story, you know what the angel says to, uh, says to Joseph, says to Mary, and as you'll see next week, says to the shepherds, don't be afraid. Those are key words that we all need to hear today. Do not be afraid. And you start, preacher, that was just pertaining to the birth of Jesus. No, that's pertaining all times, all peoples, all cultures for today. Do not be afraid. Hey, would you stand with me for the public reading of Scripture? Love the Christmas passages, the Christmas story, we call it. Uh, this is in regard to Mary. This is verse 26 of chapter 1 of the gospel of Luke says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. We talked about him last week of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement, kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. Uh, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, well, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth, who also has conceived a son in her old age, see who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing, let's say that together, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her so much. It's all truth. Okay. Front to back. It's inspired word of God, but so many just great nuggets of truth. One profound, nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus because there's nobody else. And Lord, I know that I don't know what some folks who are here, those engaging online are saying, well, it's an impossibility. This is going to work or that's going to happen or this is going to take place. But Lord, all things are possible with you. And so Lord, we come to you. We bow our hearts before you. We ask you to move and work. Lord, we need to experience your presence. We need to hear your word. We need to grasp it. And so Holy Spirit, I pray for illumination and understanding of this passage to all of us to help us understand how to overcome fears that we may have. And Lord, as always, I know there's someone here, someone who's watching, who's not born again. I pray that you save somebody today. Lord, I'm going to say it again. Lord, I pray that you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Again, thanks for standing for the public reading uh, of Scripture. So what are the truths that we see here? There's a lot. You can outline it in different ways. But, but number one, uh, in conquering our fear, number one, God's favor uh, will overcome our fears. Now, this, we see this comes right out of the text and talking with uh, Mary. When the angel comes, uh, the Bible tells us the angel comes in the sixth month. Now, I know some of you think, well, that's like June, you know, it's right after May, it's for July or, or whatever. Uh, but it, the sixth month is the idea here that uh, Elizabeth is pregnant uh, with John the Baptist and she's in her sixth month. Uh, there with John the Baptist. And we know later in the story, if you go and read it, that Mary goes and stays with Elizabeth three months and she comes back. And that's when Joseph figures out she's pregnant, you know, and then the angel comes to him. Okay. So don't confuse that. So we're talking about in context of John the Baptist. And if you don't know the story of John the Baptist, go back and read it. I'll give you a little bit of history. His daddy, Zacharias, his mother, Elizabeth, both up in age, uh, were not able to have children. Uh, Zacharias did specific duties because of his uh, lineage and who he's out of in the tribe and that. And so, he's one of the priests. And so he serves. And so it came his time to serve. And so he's there serving, burning incense. And the angel appears to him and says, hey, uh, Elizabeth's going to conceive, going to bear a child. He's going to be the forerunner uh, of the Messiah. And really, uh, Zacharias is doubting. He's doubting angel. Angel says, I'll tell you what, this is how you're going to know what's going to happen. You're not going to be able to speak. And so he couldn't speak. And so he comes out. He can't talk. He's trying to do sign language. They don't know what's going on. Anyway, he goes home and Elizabeth gets pregnant. And the 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 whole long story, I guess you can say, is that when John the Baptist is, is birthed, you got to remember, he's a guy who wore uh, a camel's hair, kind of a wild man uh, out on the Jordan River, preaching the gospel, you know, and telling people to repent and eating locusts and wild honey. This is who he was. But 
uh, when he was born, they kept asking. The parents said, what is his name? And Elizabeth said, uh, his name is John. They said, we don't have any relatives named John. Why are you naming that? And so Zacharias writes on a tablet and he says this. He says, his name is John. And then poof, okay, he can speak. And it like scares everybody to death. You know, it says they start giving glory to the Lord because of what's taking place. That was a long story, but that's kind of in verse one, okay? The context of that. So the angel appears, it's in the context of her being pregnant, Elizabeth with John the Baptist. Uh, he goes to the Virgin Mary, okay? Uh, she is a godly Old Testament saint. Uh, she is righteous. She is also a woman uh, who's a sinner in need of a savior. Now, we're on this side of the cross. So we look back, we know Jesus came, uh, born of a Virgin Mary, placed in a feeding trough, grows up, 100% man, 100% God, sinless perfection, perfect sacrifice, sheds his blood on the cross, was raised from the dead on the third day, offers forgiveness uh, to anyone who will receive it. Amen? That's good news, right? So we're on this side. This is what we know. We look back in faith, believing at what Christ did for us and receiving that. Mary is on this side of the cross. So in the Old Testament, you're saved the same way in the Old Testament as in the New Testament, it's by faith. She knew a redeemer was coming. She knew a deliverer was coming. She knew that the blood of the bulls and the heifers and the goats and all that was just a kind of a precursor pointing toward the Messiah, pointing toward the deliverer. And she knew that So She was looking and believing in faith of the one who was to come in the future. You see, Old Testament states, saints saved by faith the same way as in the New Testament, we're justified by faith. That's why the Bible says Abraham justified by faith. And we see in the New Testament justified by faith. So the angel comes and he appears to her and he says greetings to her like, hello, you know, and you can imagine uh, Gabriel, he's like one of the top angels and it, it probably did frighten her. And he tells her, don't be afraid. He says, you are the favor one. You've found favor with God when you look at that in text. And so she was kind of perplexed about that. She didn't understand what kind of salutation this was. So again, Mary was processing all the things that was going on in her mind. Why would this angel uh, come to me? You know, I'm from Nazareth. I'm in a poor family, basically. I'm engaged to a man named Joseph, who's a carpenter. Uh, you know, we got this plan for our life. And so what can this angel Angel, uh, be doing. And again, he tells her in verse 28, he says, greetings. He says, the Lord is with you. Now with Mary, you know, what he has told her is that, Hey, the Lord is with you. And that means the Lord has been married. The Lord's been with you in the past. The Lord is with you now. And the Lord's going to be with you in the future. Now, what does that mean? How does God's favor overcome our fears? All the scholars, if you go back and read in commentaries, 98% uh, of them are going to tell you this. They're going to say that Mary, uh, growing up in the town of Nazareth, okay, she was kind of an outlaying town, okay, and that the, the Jews in Jerusalem looked down upon Nazareth. You remember in the Bible where they talk about Jesus and those Pharisees, okay, and Jerusalem say, what good can come out of Nazareth? Uh, I don't know how many of you grew up in a small town, but I grew up in a place where I was probably so redneckish that it really didn't bother me what people thought about me or whatever. But, you know, it was almost like I'd go, We, you know, when we went to town, we had to leave Bisco to go to another town, okay? So we go to Brinkley, we go to Hazen, or we go to Stuttgart. That's what we did as teenagers. And people would ask, where are you from? Bisco. Well, sometimes folks would almost snarl their nose. You know, it's like, well, y'all don't even have a school in Bisco. You had to ride the bus to Duval's Bluff. And what good can come out of Bisco? Okay, really. Now, I guess I was so country that it really didn't bother me. I didn't have a chip on my shoulder. I emotionally don't have trauma in my life because of what people said. But that's how people look down upon her. In fact, a lot of scholars have used this language. They said it would appear to a majority of people in Jerusalem that someone like Mary was unusable by God. Do you hear that? It's unusable. But scholars will also say this. They'll say, Mary was a, an Old Testament saint, believing that a Redeemer was coming, had no idea to the angel appears that she, her womb, is going to be the Holy of Holies for the Messiah. That's why it says conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, okay? But uh, she had no idea until the angel comes and said this. But Mary was a, a sinner who was in need of a Savior. You may have heard this, and uh, you may have friends or family members who are Catholics, and they talk about the immaculate conception of Mary, that Mary uh, never sinned. You, you need to go back and search that out because you don't see that or hear that until 18, 
uh, 84, I believe, by one of the popes who came up with that. Mary, in fact, when she refers to the Lord, she talks about my God and my Savior, my Lord and my Savior. Mary was a sinner who was in need of a Savior just like all of us, okay? Now, I, I bring that out because you, you got to understand, again, conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, so 100% man and 100% God. So you, you've got divine, but you've got the incarnation, sinless perfection, Jesus going to the cross to die for us. This favor is the grace of God. It's the grace of God. Mary was in the middle of nowhere in a small town, just loving and believing as a God-fearer in what she knew in the Old Testament. And the Lord looked down upon her and Joseph, and he chose both of them, just regular folks, to be used in his kingdom. And here's what we all need to understand. Nobody is unusable by God. Nobody. You may be here this morning. You may say, well, you know, Archie, I'm here, but you don't know my past. Hey, you're exactly right. I don't know your past, but here's what you need to understand. Number one, it's by the grace of God that you're here. When you hear me as a preacher say stuff like, Lord, thank for breath in our lungs. Realize us being alive today is by the grace of God. It's the favor of God. We don't deserve it. Grace is the undeserved favor of God. Us being alive today is the undeserved favor of God. Us being able to read through this, us being able to sing a Christmas song, us being able to sing that song, uh, all my, all my hope is, I got that Zach Williams, in Jesus. Woo, what's the rest of it, Jeff? Come on, I can't remember now. All my hope is in, I got so fired up about Zach Williams, I got lost my train of thought. All my hope's in Jesus. Oh, that yesterday's gone. What's the rest of it? Help me out. All my sins are forgiven. Here we go. I've been washed by the blood. Amen. Hey, no, no. Huh. Hey. But I tell you what, it's not because, I mean, I, I know I love Zach. I think about him singing that. And Jeff got I me mean, his great song. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus. All my sins are forgiven. Been washed by the blood of Jesus. Now, that don't ring your bell, okay? As an old Argentine missionary tell me, hey, if that don't stoke your fire, your wood's wet. That's what he used to say to me all the time, okay? He said, if that don't stoke your fire, your wood's wet. I said, I know what you're talking about because I'm from a country. That ought to ring your bell right there. All of our sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That all throughout eternity, it was promised that he would come. It's preordained that he would come. He would die for you and me. Man, that, hey, let me tell you what. I know Baptists don't like to shout or get happy. That ought to make you shout. I mean, that'll make you praise the Lord. That'll make you stomp your feet, clap your hands. I mean, this is who Jesus is and what he did for us. And it's by his grace, the undeserved favor of God that you and I get to utter the words. All my hope is in Jesus. Grateful, thankful that that yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. It is a privilege. Don't ever take that for granted. And, and you know, I'll tell you why a lot of times we take that for granted. Sometimes we take that for granted because we've never been to a place where people have never heard the name of Jesus, but I have. I've been the only Anglo in a village of a white skin complexion of people who are almost 100% Muslims. And when I get out of the vehicle, they look at me and they're like, that boy ain't from here, okay? And they're fearful of me and they're watching me and they've never heard the name of Jesus. And I get back in the truck and we're driving out of that village and we're going somewhere else. And I'm always like, Lord, thank you that it's by your grace and your undeserved favor that I was born in the hospital in Brinkley, Arkansas. And by the way, they ain't had a hospital in a long time. And I was reared and raised in Bisco, Arkansas. And I went to school at DeVos Bluff. And I was brought up in church and I wasn't saved till the age of 25. It's by your grace, your undeserved favor. And may I never get over that. You see, folks, God's favor overcomes our fears. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what's ahead of us. What we do know is that Jesus is coming back. He has us here for such a time as this. Every day we have, we're graced by the day that he has given us. We need to praise him. We need to give him glory. We need to give him honor. And I'll tell you what that does. That helps to overcome those fears, okay? And that's what we see of Mary. She says, greetings. Hey, uh, Favored one, the Lord has been watching you. The Lord is with you, past, present, and future. Uh, his grace is upon you. That helps to overcome our fears. Here's the second one. God's truth overcomes our fears. So, angel says that to her, and here's what the angel says next. He says, behold, in verse uh, 31, you're going to bear or conceive 
uh, in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. And he's going to be great. He's going to be high. Uh, he's going to be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God's going to give him the throne of his father, David. And this is going to be for all eternity, okay? And his kingdom will have no end. This is a God's truth. And, and that's what we need to concentrate. I believe what the enemy wants to do today is that he... Again, he wants us to, to really focus in so much on the things that are present. Now, are they legitimate, are they valid? Yes, we're gonna have invitation in a few minutes. And I wanna encourage, if you have a family member or if you have a friend or you have a coworker, an associate that's sick, uh, that's ill, we don't have a time of prayer. If you feel comfortable, we're going to invite you to come and you can nail down to and let's pray uh, for them. I always pray for God's will to be done uh, in someone's life, but I pray for God to do a supernatural healing. And I know he's in charge of all this and I know he's large and in charge. That's what I say. He's sovereign. Uh, he's the great healer uh, in who he is. And so I pray and ask God to supernaturally move and heal folks. And so I want to encourage you to do that because again, that's God's truth. I mean, of who he is. Uh, and, and what he says that he can do. And so I place that before him. And so we'll have that invitation. I invite you to come and do that. So when you, you read this and you see the enemy wants us to focus on the things that are temporary. Yes, they're valid. They're concerns or issues that are taking place. But he wants us to take our eyes off of Jesus. And, and in this day today, this culture in which we live in, uh, you need to keep your eyes and your focus uh, upon him. You need to remember that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. When the angel came and spoke to uh, Mary and said, he's a son of God, he's a son of the most high. When, when Jesus was walking on the earth and he goes into that, uh, that place of the tombs and the, uh, the demon possessed man or men are there and they said, what do we have to do with you son of the most high God? Have you come to torment us before of this time. I mean, even the demons, they, they know uh, who the Lord Jesus is. They know who his, what his title is uh, and who he is as the, the son of God. And Mary, when the angel spoke to her, talking about the son of the most highs, is really telling her he is equal with God. We've got to keep our eyes uh, on the, the Lord Jesus Christ and to exalt him, to praise him, to sing unto him, to, to pursue him, to pray, uh, you know, to seek first his righteousness. And, and this, I mean, we're called to do that. That's where the joy uh, comes from, the joy uh, of a Lord's salvation. God's truth will overcome these fears. Sometimes folks ask in the church, they say, hey, uh, man, what are we doing next year? I say, well, here's what, here's the plan. It's subject to change, okay? Uh, we used to could make those plans. They pretty well happen and take place. Well, these days, you just don't know. But here's what I do know in the truth of the Lord. Number one, he's coming back. I've said that before. Hey, number two, he loves us. Hey, number three, he tells us he will forgive us of sin. Folks, that's good news. That's good news. There is a world out there uh, that right now, hey, they've tried to find uh, their, their God has been in their body. Okay, nothing wrong with being healthy. If you're running 10 miles a day, praise God, hallelujah, I'm for you. Uh, and if you don't eat peanut butter, amen, hallelujah, whatever that has to do with anything. But that's on my mind. I like peanut butter. But folks are, couldn't go to the gym for a while. Their God just kind of got shut down. Uh, maybe your career has become your God and you realize, man, here today, gone tomorrow. Maybe your 401k, your retirement plan, here today, gone tomorrow. Maybe possessions, maybe relationships. Maybe you were in a relationship like the love of your life and boom, they checked out on you. Uh, there is an emptiness out there today. This is a day of great opportunity. This is a day of, of, of a great openness. This is a crisis time in the lives of people who realize that there's stuff here and then it's gone. Uh, we've all had friends and family members who have gotten ill, have gone to be with Jesus. I mean, it's been a difficult time, very difficult time in the lives of, of people. So in the lives of unbelievers, there's a great openness uh, that's out there right now. And, and what it is, God's truth. Hey, it's what overcomes those fears. And you can point people to the Lord Jesus Christ and introduce them to him. And tell him he is the one uh, who came uh, to die on this cross. When we uh, have our, our Christmas Eve service, and uh, I know that uh, Bill Panic, he's already heard one of the songs uh, that the team is doing. He says, man, it's, it's just moving. Uh, it's powerful. Blake's going to share. I'm going to share the gospel. It's going to be an opportunity for people to, to receive Christ and to be saved. I mean, it's God's truth. And God's truth overcomes fears. There, you know, there are things you're in control of. Uh, do you know you get to make a choice whether you're going to brush your teeth or not? I encourage you to brush your teeth. Does everybody understand that? Y'all don't even think that's funny, do you? Okay, stay with me, okay? You get to make a choice about brushing your teeth. There's other things in life you have no control of. You cannot control that's out there, okay? God's truth can help you overcome that. And to where you get to the place and you say, look, Lord, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna praise you this morning, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna drink my coffee, I'm gonna brush my teeth, okay? 
I'm going to serve you today. I pray for wisdom and everything that comes. Every opportunity to fear is an opportunity to trust you, to believe in you, and to look to that and say, Lord, I'm going to do that. And there are things that I'm concerned about, but I have no control over. Lord, I submit them unto you. Can you imagine Mary? Now, you know the end of the story, okay? So she says, I'm your bond slave. May it be done unto me like you say. Well, that's a whole lot right there in that one verse at the end, right? That is total surrender and submission. You say, well, she was the mother of Mary. I mean, she was the mother of Jesus. Well, you got to realize she was a sinner in need of a savior. She was just like you ladies out here, a lady just like you. This said, okay, Lord, if that's what you're going to do, I surrender it because she knew his truth was overcoming her fear. Here's the last one. God's power overcomes our fear. So she is contemplating. Now, Luke was a physician. We know that. And so uh, he's trained in this, but also uh, I read this, the first time I read this for, and I, I preached this passage, you've heard it many times, I preached it many times, I didn't know this till just the other day, I, I was reading through something, uh, and it, it talked about Luke was a researcher, because he was that physician, I thought, well, that makes sense, he's wired that way, and then one commentator even said, history records for us. Whenever it says, when anything says history records for us, that means it's outside of the Bible. So it could have been something through the early church fathers, as it's called, the writings of Josephus or this. So it's outside of the Bible. It's not inspired. Okay. So it can be, uh, uh, you know, can be parts in it. We don't know exactly what it is, but one commentator said this. He said, uh, history records for us that Luke uh, really interviewed Mary about all the stuff that happened. You know, the Holy Spirit gave him this. He penned it. It's the inspired word of God. And so when it talks about she was a virgin, she was perplexed. Well, Luke being a physician knew exactly how uh, a baby being conceived would be between a man and a woman. And we know this, it's blessed in the context of marriage. And so uh, he knew how that would take place. And so Mary's pondering. She don't really understand how I can do it. And he says, hey, the angel says, you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come upon you. He's going to, the, he's going to overshadow you, the power of the Most High. And for that reason, the Son, uh, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And then he goes on, he says, by the way, Elizabeth, because when the angel brings up to her about Elizabeth, most people and that day too, she would know that Elizabeth and Zacharias had not had any children, that Elizabeth was considered barren. And so she says, hey, the angel says, by the way, just want you to know, Elizabeth's in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, the question is, do we believe that? Do we actually believe that? Here's how I want to end today. We're going to have an invitation in just a few minutes. You come, if you got someone who's sick, I invite you to come and pray. You You've got someone uh, who's a lost person in your family. However, you're going to get together this year. Maybe all of you are going to gather together. Maybe you had to make some hard decisions like we have, just the age of my dad and his health and stuff. And, and so, however, but you may have a, a family member who's lost. I would encourage you, don't give up on that family member because nothing's impossible with God. Hey, nothing's impossible with God. Sometimes people, they pay the consequences of their sin. Uh, they're, you know, you have adult children and maybe they're wayward and being a prodigal and they're making bad choices and they're adults. I mean, I, I say this all the time. Hey, they're adults. Uh, you raise them, adults make choices and they may be paying it. Don't give up on them because nothing's impossible with God. Hey, don't give up on that person that, that you know that's older, that's been rejecting the Lord for so long. Don't give up on them because nothing <coughs> is impossible with God. I would encourage you in that. And so really too, man, in, in our, our nation, we need revival. Come on, amen. Does everybody agree with that? We need revival. Revival is a renewing and refocusing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, revival, people get saved, all right? People get right, believers get right. Lost people get saved is what happens. It's a, man, I, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a move uh, of God. Uh, stealing goes down. Uh, drug uh, use uh, goes down. Immorality goes, I mean, uh, God starts moving and working uh, upon people, man. But I've, I've heard this for people like, man, our nation is too far gone. Listen to me, nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. And, and he can bring revival. I believe he wants to bring revival. I believe he wants a, a great awakening uh, to occur. And I know I, I'm repeating myself. I continue to say this. I want to keep it in front of us as a church, but nothing is impossible with God. Don't give up on our nation. Don't give up on calling uh, upon the Lord. And don't buy into that thought, well, God doesn't care and God doesn't know where we are and God has written us off. The Lord tells us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face, will repent, I will heal their land. That is a passage that applies to us today. But in all honesty, what's the church doing? Does the church really believe that nothing is impossible with God? You see, God's power 
overcomes our fears. We don't know, again, what we may say all the future holds. We know Jesus is coming back. We know it's going to be sometime in the future. We know he's large and in charge. We know he's sovereign. We know he's on the throne and we know he loves us. And we know here, we know this, man, he brings forgiveness of sins. You know, I know there are those here and there are those that are watching. You're as lost as you can be. And when I say as lost as you can be, that means you start, you know what I learned a long time ago is that uh, it spiritually, dealing with the people, if you don't know you're lost, you can't be saved, okay? I've been in the woods, I don't say many times, a few times, that, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're out in the woods and you're hunting or whatever. This happens a lot when you're in a boat in the backwater of the river in the woods, duck hunting, and everything looks the same or whatever, and you, you feel like you know where you're going, okay? As long as you feel like you know where you're going, you'll be out there putting around with that boat murder, just going through the woods. And everybody in the front of the boat is saying stuff like, you don't know where you're going. I know where I'm going. I, I know, I've done this my whole life. I know where I'm going. I got it. You just sit up there and be quiet, okay? I got, and you're putting around out there. And the guy in the back driving that motor, he does not know that you're lost until it hits him that he's lost. And I've been in a situation like that myself, driving the motor, telling everybody else to be quiet, I know where I'm going. And all of a sudden, I stop, and there's a fear that comes over me. Because if it's 20 degrees, you're in the backwater on the White River, and you got a little old boat motor, and it's starting to, you know, especially if you're out there hunting in the evening or whatever, and it's starting to get dark, and you're thinking, I'm going to be out here all night in this boat, and there's a, a three old grizzly, uh, long-haired boys here with me, and I don't want us to keep warm and have to get up next to each other. I mean, there's a fear that comes over. And you know what happens, though? Man, when that fear, when you realize you're lost, all of a sudden, you start, you start admitting, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. What are we going to do? And then your buddy says, well, my daddy told me this fire shot off about every 10 minutes, because if I don't come home, he's going to come looking for me. I said, okay. You know, I mean, stuff like that. And, and here's what I realized. You can be sitting in a service 10 years in a row and there's nothing going on. And all of a sudden you realize you're lost. That is the undeserved favor of God upon your life right there. That's the grace of God. Don't, don't forsake that. And you need to understand that's a unique privilege of the Lord. You see, that's how the Lord works. And I know there'd be someone here, someone watching. You realize I'm lost. And what that means, you know, I'm separated from the Lord. And here's what we know in the truth of Scripture. The Lord says, whosoever calls upon the name of him shall be saved. Because of Jesus Christ coming, being born of a virgin Mary, placed in the feeding trough, growing up sinless, perfection, walking on this earth. We have the teachings that we see uh, in the New Testament, him saying that he's come to reveal all to God's revelation to man that we see in the word and through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and going to that cross and staying on that cross for you and me and being raised from the dead on the third day. When you come to that place and you say, hey, Mary was looking that way, okay, we're here, we're looking back and you come and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. You're right, I'm wrong. You're the savior, I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me, Lord, I repent of my sins. Lord Jesus, save me. The Bible says he'll save you. You see, that's the invitation this morning. Some, we need to pray for those who are sick. Uh, there are some who need to pray for those who are lost folks in your family and workplace. There are those who need to pray, Lord, restore to me and renew to me the joy of your salvation. Uh, that may be for some believers this morning. Some of you need to, it's really saying, Lord, I recommit my life to you. Hey, I encourage you right there where you are. Maybe you're engaged online or you're here in person. You can come. There's pastors here. Uh, they'll be glad to pray with you. They got uh, their mask on. So that's part of the invitation. But also know there's some here who do not have that relationship with Jesus. It is God's undeserved favor shining upon your heart today and do not take that for granted because that favor may not happen next week. That undeserved favor may not happen next month. If you're sitting here saying, well, I got to get my stuff together. I got to start doing right. I'm going to get cleaned up. I'm going to go do this. Uh, no, Jesus says, you come to me as you are. I'll clean you up. I'll take care of you. You see, that's the word for some of you. And you say, man, God can't do that for me. Yeah, nothing's impossible with God. I always say, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Anybody else out there like that? If God can save you, he can save anybody. Would you agree with me? Hey, this is who our Lord is. This is who we serve. Don't take this invitation for granted. You know, I've said this many times in 16 years. And it's not that I'm trying to be weird. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. 
But there's some of you here and some of you watching, you won't be here this time next year. It happens every year. You hear his word today, but you won't be here this time yesterday. It's our days on earth are numbered. And it's appointed unto man to, to die in the face of judgment. Today's the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's the Christmas story that many of us know very well. But the question is, Lord, did we take it to heart? We realize nothing's impossible with you. Lord, I pray this morning we wouldn't hold back. I pray where we need to pray, we pray. Where we need to praise, we praise. Lord, where we need to rejoice, we rejoice. Where we need salvation, I pray we call upon you this morning. I pray, Lord, you would do a work in us for your glory and your honor. Your name we pray, the name of Jesus, amen.